Incredible stories here on the Michael Finkley Show. We have Coach Eddie. It was one of the best experiences that I had. You know, um, I got a launch director award. And Alan Cabanero. Whenever you become start to become a teenager, you're like, uh, you know, you're kind of just pushing a little bit away. Coming up. Okay, everybody, buckle your seatbelts because the Michael Finkley Show has a brand new home. The Michael Finkley Show is now a part of the Greater Works Network on Roku TV. To watch, add the Greater Works Network channel to your Roku TV. Congratulations, Finkley! Just to see a brighter side. Cause I've been working all my life just to make it. Just to make it. Just to make it. I've been working all my life. Hey, welcome to the Michael Finkley Show. I'm Michael Finkley. Today is Friday, January 29th, 2021. We made it to another end of the week, y'all. Again, as I always say, take the weekend out and just do something for yourself. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Michael Finkler Show. Ring the bell for notification. We'll send you an email saying, hey, new content uploaded. Thank you so much to our subscribers, our viewers, our future subscribers, our future viewers. You're watching The Michael Finkler Show, where we're here to inform, educate, and inspire you around your shows that you need to hear and that you want to hear as well. Thank you so much. So today, again, as you know, I love incredible stories. We have two more today. We have Coach Eddie and then we also have Alan Cominero with us and again you will not want to miss these stories but I must 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 mention this on yesterday we lost a jewel within film within bringing the realistic black woman to life as we saw on television and film Cicely Tyson passed away at the age of 96 years old and she meant a lot, a lot to us uh, within her roles that she portrayed, just the person she was in this industry. Again, there would not be another Cicely Tyson. So take a look at some of these awesome moments. Next, we have Coach Eddie. We'll be right back. Celebrating gospel music on the Michael Finkley Show, we have Marcus G. Morton. And we also have Lanasia Tyson with us. Next, Finkley. Monday. Looking for a mentoring program for your young male between the age of 6 and 18 in Columbia, South Carolina? Well, look no further. Big Homie, Lil Homie Mentoring Program is the program for you. Under the leadership of Mr. Jamal Stroud, Big Homie, Lil Homie is a 50C3 nonprofit organization that caters and mentors at risk youth that come from single parent homes. The organization caters to young males between the ages of 6 and 18 within the greater Columbia area. The organization is devoted to shaping and molding their life into great men of society. Big Homie Little Homie organizes male gatherings, discussions, and even educational assistance devoted to guiding and leading them into a positive light. Making a positive attitude will help in transforming a life regardless of what is experienced in life. For more information on Big Homie Little Homie Mentoring Program, visit our social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
Does your kid rock? Wednesdays, we feature kids that rock. Want to participate? Email us at michaelthefinkleyexperience.com and tell us your story. Wednesdays. the Michael Finkley show. Again, we have the, another incredible individual with an incredible story. And I hope that students that are watching um, take heed to this as in a career path and in broadening your rise into what you really want to be in life, in your own path. So we have life coach, father, former engineer, uh, real estate connoisseur, <laughs> There's so many other names here. We have Coach Eddie. How are hey. you? Hey, I'm doing good, doing good. Thank you for the intro. I don't know if I'm that big. <laughs> I, oh, I, I, I had to limit it, actually, because there were some, yeah, yeah. some other ones I could have named as well. But we thank you so much for being on and a willing vessel to just share, to just share some positivity. Absolutely. We appreciate you. Absolutely. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for what we're going to talk about. Yay! Yes! So, Coach Eddie, um, when did you know you had a voice to change the, the atmosphere around you and also the lives of others around you? Well, I struggled with one question as I, like, grew up. You know, I don't know why this one question kept on coming up, especially when I was, like, a teenager. I kept on thinking... It's impossible for one man to affect change. It has to be a group of people. And I, it was just a common theme throughout my like youth and thinking, could one man voice really can impact or move things or change things? And eventually when I got into my thirties and then now my forties, yes, it can, <laughs> you know? If you really have, if you really use the voice and the story that God has given you mm -hmm. and you hold on to that story and you find your voice, you could affect so much change. So, so um, my own journey have kind of reflected that. And um, I guess we'll go into that. I mean, as we go through the questions, mm -hmm. um, but it's been, it's been, it's been a very interesting ride. Mm -hmm. And a part of that ride uh, you have been through and seen a lot, been through a lot, uh, working in many different arenas. And one of those that really stuck out to me when I uh, actually found you on social media, I think it was through LinkedIn, NASA, NASA. And that, yeah. that was just like, a, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never seen a person of color in my, in my right, because I come from a very small town here in South Carolina. Uh, that represented or was affiliated with this organization. Can you tell us about that experience? I, I went into a small engineering company and I started a small business called Iconic Talent. Mm -hmm. um, Iconic Talent, we actually did, we had models for um, the Daily Buzz. It was a nationally syndicated show. We actually was, uh, we had, it was like a talent agency. We had models that we, you know, contracted out. Mm -hmm. We had a website at the time. Iconic Talent is like, Somebody else bought that domain because I, once I went to NASA, I kind of sold it. But mm -hmm. we were the initial iconic talent. Like we had models for the Daily Buzz. We used to do runway shows in Orlando. They used to hire our models. And, you know, I even got some of my friends' children on the show. Um, and I did that for a couple years and with my engineering company. And then things start slowing down with the engineering company. Mm -hmm. And I had to rely completely on my entertainment company. Gotcha. Lo and behold, <laughs> lo and behold, you know, at that time I was a, I, I, I was a single father with two kids. Mm. I s decided to start um, submitting my resume to, I'll put my resume out there because my engineer, the engineering company I was going for, the contract was ending and I wanted to put my resume out there. And lo and behold, I started putting my resume out there and mm. I met my girlfriend at the time at church and we went up to new york and they said hey we want to do an interview at that time they did interviews over the phone gotcha. which was awesome <laughs> these days these days you have to go in to do an interview right mm -hmm. um so when they when when they did the interview over the phone um they was kind of questioning me asking me um you know am i okay with this job position and i did not know 
where it was located specifically. They just right. said we are on the east coast of Florida. Okay. Um, oh, Port Canaveral. At, at that time, I didn't know Port Canaveral was NASA, you know? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> which was the craziest thing. So I said, okay, yeah, we got an interview. They loved me. They said, okay, uh, when you come back, you have a job, just come to the Melbourne office and do paperwork. And lo and behold, after I came from that trip, I went to the Melbourne office and said, okay, you're, you're, you're going to be at Kennedy Space Center. And so I didn't even know when I got into NASA how I got into NASA. I got in through the back door. Like Boeing oh hired me as a contractor. And mm -hmm. then when I got in, I couldn't believe it. You know, right. uh, I, I called my girlfriend at the time. I said, I'm working at NASA. <laughs> you know, she couldn't, she couldn't believe it, you know, at the time, you know. Um, fast forward, you know, um, uh, I, I eventually got married, you know, had two more kids so that I had four girls mm -hmm. and um, I worked at NASA for five years and it was a beautiful experience. I didn't only work at NASA, I was a decorated engineer at NASA. I, re I received a lot of Space Flight Awareness Award. I received recognition, uh, uh, appreciation award, like from the uh, site director, the launch director, it was crazy. And my whole goal, to be honest, at the time when I first got into NASA, I stayed focused, to be honest. When I first got there, I said, I am going to get recognized because that's gonna be good on my resume. Mm -hmm. I wanna get like certificates, mm -hmm. I wanna get official recognition. Cause when you Google my name, you'll see those recognition on it from yeah. NASA. Mm -hmm. It's good in the industry, it's good. Regardless, you know, people working there, it was like they were there and appreciate, they, it's like they were, they, they, it was like nothing for them. Like, oh yeah, we're working here, whatever. But I, I was focused on like getting attention from key individuals. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a couple uh, years and it was one of the best experiences that I had, you know. Um, I got a launch director award um, and it was awesome. Like they did an awesome ceremony um, and it was a beautiful experience. And that's when I stopped finding my voice, to be honest. Because when I was at NASA, I was the lead reliability space shuttle engineer and I did all the training for reliability. I proved the paperwork for the USA contractor for our system assurance analyses, um, for all the ground support equipment for the launch vehicle. And I started seeing how the system work, you know, mm -hmm. how I would find my voice, how I would find my place in, you know, the professional atmosphere. At first, I would allow other people to take credit for my work. I would be just take take a step back. But then when I started finding my voice, I just started speaking up and say, hey, you know, we worked on this together. We, you know, and but I played the game politically because I realized, you know, especially in Florida, that my excellence was a threat, you know, so I couldn't be too excellent and I couldn't be too unapologetic. Right. Later on in life, I became unapologetic and I became more who I am is what I am. And that's it. Right. You know, and that's how you see Coach because that was mm -hmm. early on in my career and you know me growing into my voice and growing into who I am. And I had a big stuttering problem back then. Really? I couldn't present. Yes. Most people don't know. I could, anytime I went and presented in front of anyone, I stuttered like crazy because I was like oh, not my knowing my voice, not knowing. And I did not know, like, like I was articulate. I thought I sounded crazy. I was so like, in my head, you know? Um, what you see now is totally different than who I was. Like I told you, like I had this one, this oh, theme in my head from early on, could one man voice really impact things or change? And that, that kept on being a theme throughout my life. And then when I started finding my voice and started finding who I was is when I discovered my purpose. Wow. Wow. And to say all those different, you know, things happen in life because life happens, right? When we have something planned, here's yeah. life throwing something else at us. You were still persistent in your doing. And so you crossed over from, from NASA and, and then went into how did real estate come into the picture? Nothing was passed down to me. Mm -hmm. Nothing was passed down to me. I want generational wealth. So I'm going to go into real estate. So all the profits that I make, I'm going to purchase property in Orlando. Mm -hmm. You know, I purchased property, I purchased a couple property and I flipped a couple properties and that's how I got into real estate. Right. And then I became a realtor 
And that was a whole journey in itself. And as a realtor, you have to have your own image. So I've learned to be like the image of Eddie, Eddie the realtor, but I really still had the voice thing. Like I was like not really confident in speaking in public spaces. Mm -hmm. I was really confident talk. One on one, I'm okay with people, but like in public spaces, I would get this. I don't know if I wouldn't call it anxiety, but like this anxiousness, gotcha. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that's how I got into real estate. Um, wow. Then after that, you know, you know, I, I, I had a marriage during that time. And then after my marriage ended, I, I, I think I found my voice even more, <laughs> you know? I feel like it's so weird. I mean, marriage is a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. period, you know? Um, but I do think, I do understand the scripture where it says, it's better not to marry because it's gets in the way of your ministry. And sometimes mm -hmm. you can focus on each other opposed yeah. to your ministry. I think mar marriage is a beautiful thing in context of the ministry of God, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so after my marriage ended, it has blessed me. So everything that I've acquired from my marriage, it has blessed me in seeing the, uh, the nuances of relationships, the nuances mm -hmm. of the importance of your own voice and understanding who you are in God yeah. and not allowing the world to dictate it, not even your spouse to dictate a limited understanding of who you are. So when you break out that box and you find your voice, you kind of become unapologetic, mm -hmm. you know? Before I wasn't mm -hmm. unapologetic, but now I'm unapologetic. I'm unapologetic me, like, mm -hmm. you know? so. I am I, I, I am a leader. So in the companies that I work for, I'm with, I'm a solid leader. Like I don't, I'm a solid leader. You, yes, I have a black skin, but I'm not gonna, there's not gonna be low balling. There's not gonna be um, this game where you're gonna disrespect, dishonor, devalue. I'm gonna account for the work that I've done. You're gonna account for it too. And if I have an expectation of greatness, it's because I'm displaying greatness. And do not try to take that away from me. And you know, it's it's still, I mean, this world is not set up for that, but yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, I have this philosophy that we are traveling the universe. We're traveling the universe and we're finding our orbit, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know how a planet finds its orbit? How? It travels, it travels the universe. And then it finds an orbit where there's no friction because it's held by gravity by the sun mm -hmm. and where its own energy is balanced. So if it goes in an orbit and there's a lot of friction and its energy is imbalanced, it keeps moving until it finds its own, the right orbit. And then where it finds an orbit where its energy is balanced and there's no friction, that's where they belong. That's where that planet belongs. That's my philosophy in life. Like, if I can't be unapologetically me and it causes too much friction, I don't belong there. So I'm going to keep on traveling the universe where I belong. And where I belong is where I, my energy is balanced and where I'm accepted. So uh, that's where, like, life coach Eddie got evolved and becoming. Because I started counseling younger people. I started counseling couples during the church. I started counseling, uh, coaching um individuals so you know I, I created TikTok and exploded and um that's where coach eddie came and now mm -hmm. we're helping people I'm, i mean to see the things that we're doing it's crazy you know um it's crazy to see people lives are turned around because i'm a big advocate now mm -hmm. you know i'm a big proponent on everyone has a story like i feel like yeah. we're not we're not the anti-church movement but, but we are like the now, you know how at a church, you go to church and the preacher is speaking to you? Yeah. Our ministry is a little bit different. We want the stories from the congregation because we believe you sharing your story or your testimony is where healing is going to take place. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So when I'm coaching, I that's all I do. i like, we need to go share. Because a lot of my clients, a lot of my coaching, uh, I call them teammates, are like, holding their testimony and are scared to share it because they feel shame. I'm like, mm. no, don't feel shame. Because God is going to use your story to free thousands or a hundred thousands of people or a million people. So he was using you as a special tool to free others. So don't feel like it's a shameful thing. Feel special that you have went through that because God's going to use you. Maybe someone else couldn't go through it. There would have been 
or you know dead or uh, you know they wouldn't have been able to make it but you're going to be used as a special tool you know so we're working at having people share their own stories um and do coaching and and ha having them make their own social media posts or their TikToks or they're sharing their story. So we have a whole ministry and we're getting their stories out there and we've seen healing take place. We've seen people becoming like finding their own voice, <laughs> you know? Like I said, this whole journey started with finding that one voice, you know, one voice impact right. lives. And it's, right. it's at a point where it can, and I'm helping others find their own voice. Amazing. So, yeah. Oh, I my like God. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you are fine. It's, a, it's amazing. This is what this platform is for, is for persons to share um, what they need to and what they want to in order for healing for themselves and also for the persons that are watching so they can be healed and encouraged and motivated and inspired in their own personal rights. And so yeah. you, you mentioned earlier your daughters. Yeah. Um, I see on your social media, they mean the world to you. Yes, they do. They're, you're very involved. You're very active. What kind of father are you? I'm a very active father, which is, is which is, I love my kids. <laughs> I love all my kids. And I think most fathers do. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, I'm going to be very transparent and honest. Mm -hmm. I do think in the culture that we have currently in America, they demonize the black father a lot. Oh, of course. And yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I feel like a lot of, I mean, in my circles, a lot of fathers are very active and want to be in a children's life. And some of them don't have a type A personality where they will keep fighting and drive, you know, because sometimes, a lot of times, the mother interrupts their relationship with the child, you know? And not not all the time, but a lot of times, you know, like they'll get in the middle of it. So I'm a type of father that no one's going to interrupt my relationship with the father. I will go to, I'll do what I need to do to make sure I am in my children's life and they are well taken care of and they are well loved. So um, I love my children. They are blessing from God. Um, I have four girls. I always wanted a boy. Um, but I think children need both a mother and father. It's very important. And a mother's role is very important. But thank oh, God yeah. for my. You know, thank God for mothers. But I, fathers are very critical. And you're right. I have two girls that are in college. You know, they're doing their own thing. You know, I got to keep off their social media because it gives me heart attack <laughs> like to watch them in certain clothing. I can't. I can't. Right. They're turning 21 this year. Wow. Uh, and I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old. Oh, wow. And what type of legacy do you want to leave for them? The type of legacy I want them to, to leave for them is a legacy of integrity mm. and being honest and being unapologetic about who you are. Mm. You know, I feel like a lot of people are enslaved either by their thinking or by their limited pot. Like they're in a pot that you like, you can, an oak seed, right? Mm -hmm. An oak tree can grow really big. It's one of the biggest trees out there, right? Right. And really. But if you take that same seed and put it in a small pot, will it ever grow big? Mm -hmm. You know? So I think a lot of people are seeds in small pots and they refuse it to come. Yeah, come out of those pots. They refuse it. They, they got to actually say, nah, I can't be in this pot. I got bigger things involved. I want my kids, my legacy is hoping that my kids are all awake enough to not limit themselves by others' expectation. I want them to have a voice and speak their voice and not be under enslaved by anybody. If they see something wrong, they speak up. If they if they have an idea, they speak up. They don't let no one come and railroad them. They have their own thing. I want people when they deal with them, know the walls around them, that they can't just roll over them. If right. I if my kids embrace that, which is all within the Bible, uh, a relationship with God, that's everything. Everything. You know? Oh yeah. my gosh. You are laying some jewels down today, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Coach Eddie here, y'all. Coach Eddie. Yeah. So yeah. Coach Eddie, when, when persons look at you, what do you want people to think of? I want people to think of I like I kind of said it like 
freedom. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, if you talk to any of my friends, I want I want people to be free and find what who what God made you to do and who you are in God. Mm-hmm. You know, and I th- this shackles that we have, we ho- we hold so much shackles to individuals, to corporations, to different entities. I pray that we all be who we are meant to be in Christ. That means fulfilling our ministry. How is that done? The only way we can fulfill our ministry is to share our testimony. testimony. That's the only way to, because that'll help under your testimony. Like Michael, the way you grew up and how you grew up to this point Mm -hmm. is a part of your ministry. And it reveals to you where you need to be today, Right. right? People too often throw their story or throw their testimony to the side and act like it's nothing. And they look at other people's testimony and say, oh, well, wow, I wish my life was like, don't wish. You have a set of life experiences, a story that is going to shape you for your future. Let's watch it, dwell in your story, and God will reveal your next step. So you can, God will reveal your destiny and your purpose. So I, my whole goal is for people to share their story. Stop closing it up. Stop allowing people to be your voice. Have your own voice, you know? Because as, you know, I mean, I'm a believer, so I'm gonna talk in terms of the Bible. You know, Satan does a good job trying to close our mouth, trying to close our perspective, trying to make us into like a robot, trying to make us into something else. I want people to be who God called them to be. And the only way they can do that is if they be reflective of their story. Yes, there's gonna be a lot of pain because they their story was meant to craft them into a special tool. If we understand that, don't run away from that shame, but share it and don't care about judgment. You know, I had somebody here the other day, uh, they were sharing their stuff and I was recording them and they were sharing their story. And they was like, but the judgment, I was like, who's gonna judge you? <laughs> who can judge you? Tell me, tell me who, even President Obama can judge you. There's nobody right. that can judge you. Nobody. Who can judge you? Mm-hmm. When you share your testimony, you're doing a beautiful thing. You know, you can't be judged. This is your story and look at how, God, it's really, really how good God is because mm-hmm. you're sharing your testimony and you're here today. That's it. You're here today. You're breathing, you have a solid job. You're here today. Like, you know, so my whole thing, when somebody look at me, I want them to share their testimony, find their voice. Do not allow the world. It gets me mad when the world suppresses people. Like, you know, I try to go in and say, hey, you know, you know, you are greater. Do not let those lies penetrate your, exactly. thought, your thought process or your mind, you know? Exactly. exactly. So that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm on a mission to help people share their story. So if you go to lifecoacheddy.com, you'll see we have a whole process. It's, you subscribe, you heal with a coach, and then you share your story. It's a three-step process. Um, I have a whole new ministry that I started up this year. It's called Oasis, International Oasis, intloasis.com. And you can kind of see uh, different people sharing their story. And that's going to expand. You know, it's going to expand. And that, that whole, it's going to be a place, it's going to be a sanctuary where people can go and see others sharing their own testimony so they can, here and they can feel like they're not alone, gotcha. you know? Oh my gosh, especially in the world we live in today. Oh my gosh, we need all the encouragement, yeah. inspiration, positivity Absolutely. that we can have because I dare not want to lose Absolutely. my mind in this chaos that's going on. So we have a vessel here, right here in Coach Eddie that will assist us in that right. Coach Eddie, thank you so much. You gave some awesome information, awesome jewels. You know where to find you. We appreciate your time and your story, your knowledge and your experiences. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you. That was awesome. Coming up, we have Alan Cavanero. We'll bring it back. I'm just not college material. I am tired of school. I'm just not sure what I want to do after graduation. Sound familiar? Welcome to the Prelo Educational Institute. Our focus is to help young people prepare for life after high school. It's never too early to start planting the seed for education, career, and life overall. The Prelo Educational Institute is made up of the following two products. The first product is the book titled, I Ain't Going to College, A Guide for Life After High School. 
This is the first book of a series that introduces middle and high school students to a young man struggling to find his way and make the decision about whether attending college is the right choice for him or not. The book has questions inside and a supplemental curriculum can also be purchased. The newest product from the Prelo Educational Institute is our online course titled Preparing for Life After High School. In this course, students will learn about decision-making, self-confidence, accountability, self-awareness, and many other topics that speak to social-emotional learning. Young people will read a story about a young man who never gave up no matter what the circumstances were. The course is interactive and has questions, quizzes, and video. Do not wait until your child or student is a senior in high school to start planning. Enroll today. To enroll and learn more, please visit www.speakerauthormarlow.com. Need a little motivation? Timothy Clifton is with us every week on Mondays to get your week started with a little motivation. All here on The Michael Finkley Show. Calling all trio, gear up, jag, and other college readiness organizations. Hello everybody, it's Finkley with the Finkley Experience. I am here to offer you information about our College Readiness Cohort Series. This College Readiness Series includes college applications, SAT, ACT prep, scholarships, financial aid, the mental mind state, HBCU versus PWI versus technical colleges, and so much more. You know this is helpful because it's actually like making me change my college plan. Really? If you're interested, visit our website at thefinkleyexperience.com or just email us at michael at thefinkleyexperience.com. We're looking forward to working with you. show as you know i love to interview persons with amazing incredible stories and again have we have another one with us ladies and gentlemen introducing you to the world alan cabanero hello how are you doing michael how are you alan doing well doing well definitely honored to be on here oh it's such a pleasure i have to tell the, i have to tell our viewers how we met so we met through this awesome organization and as introductions were going on i said i have to reach out to this person i, I could just see something was there and i tell you it was and it's still there and it's still manifesting to this day so alan take us back what was life like growing up for you so um for me it was basically so a little bit about me, I was actually born in Mexico, uh, Mexico City to be exact. And so, you know, whenever um, my mom brought me over here because my parents kind of split up, you know, around that time that uh, between I was born and then, you know, until I got to about one and a half years old. And so when, when we got over here, um, you know, she became a waitress to this day, she's a waitress, right? And so growing up uh, for me, childhood was basically uh, just a mother, mother figure more than anything, right? Obviously, you, yeah. you, when you have just one figure, they try to be both, but it's very difficult, especially for me being a boy, becoming a man, right? And so right. Um, growing up, I didn't really have too much to be passionate about, kind of just jumped on whatever everybody else was doing uh, in terms of video games, in terms of whatever, right? Like I, I just wanted people to like me. That was kind of my attitude because um, I don't know, maybe it was because I didn't have a father figure but um, around probably 10 or 11, I started to really realize uh, my mom was working a lot and, you know, kind of my other classmates always had at least one or two parents home when they got home, right? A lot of people get off at, you know, four or five. That's when we were getting back home, right? And so both parents would be there or maybe at least one, right? For me, it was the other way around. My mom left when I left and she come back probably eight, right? And if it was, you know, if it was busy, it was a good day probably 11, 10, right? Maybe see you for an hour, Monday through Friday. So, and then Saturdays and Sundays are worse, right? If you've done any serving or being a waitress, what waiter, I mean, those are prime days. If yeah. you don't work Saturday and Sunday, Michael, you, you, you can agree with me on that. You're yeah. not making much money, right? Yeah. Unless you, you know, work at like a, a really high-end restaurant, right? Right. But um, so obviously I saw work ethic. I also saw that I had to make some source of income um but i didn't know what that looked like right i mean 
Um, I, I feel like whenever a man or a boy turning into a, a man doesn't have a father figure, they're always searching for one. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, is that what, you know, is that what a man looks like? Oh, is that, and, and maybe people will look at social media, people will look at, uh, you know, politics, and they'll try to find a father figure. Thankfully for me, when I turned 13, uh, my stepdad kind of came into the picture, right? Yeah. Um, it was kind of like a movie scene. Um, my, uh, my dad kind of made his move at a restaurant, right, where my mom was working. And, you know, basically, um, asked her out on a date, I guess, after second or third time, and they kept going on dates, right? And at first, I didn't really accept that because it was, you know, it's me and my mom, right? But um, stepdad kind of came into the picture, and in my head, I'm like, well, this probably means I'm going to spend more time with my mom. You know, all my other classmates, sometimes just the dad works, right? And so mm-hmm. I was like, well, if he's going to be my stepdad, my mom's going to work less, right? She's not going to work because um, he made enough to, to not for us not to have her work but right. she never really had that attitude. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I saw that and then I started to really learn things from my stepdad that I didn't learn from my mom, which was even if, even if maybe, you know, let, let's say, let's say we have an extra $300 in our account, Michael, if I have the money and I don't have anything to pay for and I have the money and someone needs it, give it without expecting anything in return right? That's, that's, and I think that's vital. I mean, I think that's, you're giving without expecting in return, that's pure kindness. And so that's something I learned from him um, growing up. And I feel like, you know, obviously a mesh of both kind of start to direct you towards where you're going to go in life, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then um, I guess, you know, fast forward to high school, right? We ended up moving a little bit more north for a better high school uh, environment, right? Per se. And I think in high school, you start to figure out who you are a little bit, right? Yeah. And I've always been a shy kid. Um, but, um, you know, growing up from 13 till, uh, what, what is it, 18, mm-hmm. I, I started to open up a little bit more, right? I started realizing, okay, well, I love soccer. Let me double down on that. You know, ended up playing club, got a little bit better, right? And so um, that's what I was passionate about, soccer. But everything outside of that, I, I didn't really know how to communicate with people, right? It was just, you know, that friend group that you have in high school, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, so I started to really think, well, what do I want to do? I mean, what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to, what direction do I want to go? But my parents always said, kind of go to college, right? That's the way to go, especially mm-hmm. if you're first gen. I yeah. mean, it's no brainer. If you don't go, it's like, well, then why did your parents sacrifice so much for you to be here, you know? Um, but in my head, I'm like, well, you know, all these people are saying, is it going to be worth it? My teachers are like, absolutely. Go get your master's. Go get your, you know what I mean? Like, just go all out, right? And so uh, I'm, I'm reading all these different things. But I mean, I can't get advice from my father. He's never been in college. I can't get advice from my mom. Right. right? And so let's talk about your biological father. And I, I can truly relate to that story. My biological father was not there um, present as he should have been, but that hero came in, my stepfather, and again, showed me things that my mom could not, um, even in my teenage years. And so how was that uh, relationship now with your biological father? Is it is it um, consistent? Is it even present? Um, it's here and there. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to he, you know, he's a business owner himself, right? And and ironically, right? And so he, you know, he he runs a business in Mexico and he's basically selling to bigger manufacturers. Um, and so his time is basically like he'll have an hour free, right? He has two kids in Mexico that I've never met, but I just believe that that relationship's really not there, mm-hmm. uh, very present because there's never been time put into it. Gotcha. Do you, you have know? any ill feelings towards him? No, no. Now, if you asked me that when I was 18, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Obviously, you. I mean, I'm sure you can relate to this. Maybe you feel like maybe it was your fault or you're like, well, what's wrong with me? Why? Why, why is my father not even speaking to me? You know, because mm-hmm. um, he did stop speaking to me for a good while. So. Uh, what about you? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's a, still a process, even at the age of 
almost 32 years old, I'm still in the process of forgiving, still in the process of forgiving. Um, and so we still, we chat, we text or what have you, but at the end of the day, there's still some things that I have to figure out in my mind um, to get over, right. yeah, to get over, to, to tr truly, fully forgive for me, truly forgive for me. And I know that's a process, right? That's definitely a process. I know that's something that you probably have felt as well throughout the years. Um, and so with your, with your mother, you know, it when, with you being the, her son and, you know, just the two of you, um, I know that sometimes instead of kind of like being a, because uh, I felt this with my mama too, um, kind of like being instead of a son, mother, it's kind of like a husband, wife thing, because, you know, I am, I'm, I'm protective over my mother, you know, when she needs money, I give it to her, you know, that type of thing. So describe the relationship with your mom. Well, um, I've always been, you know, locked arms with my mom, right? Growing up. And obviously, um, I, I believe whenever you become, start to become a teenager, you're like, ah, uh, you know, you kind of just pushing a little bit away, not because you don't love her, but because you don't want to be seen too close to your mom. Right. Um, but I think it's definitely still there. Right. I mean, you know, we don't spend as much time together as we would, you know, when, when I was younger and she had to take me places. Right. And she had that responsibility, but it's definitely a relationship that we, continue to cultivate, um, you know, every two days, every three days. So that's, that's, it's really good. Yeah. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Those, so the, the bond is still there, no matter what, the bond is still there. And you mentioned as well that you're originally from Mexico and now you're living in the South. So within that transition within your life, were there any like maybe ill feelings towards maybe um, from other students or teachers because you, you maybe look different or sounded different? Um, not necessarily. No. I mean, um, you know, there, there's always the, the stereotype of, Oh, you know, he's definitely from Mexico, right? He speaks Spanish. He's from Mexico. And, um, it's been like that. Right. And, and I mean, it was something that as, as a kid, I got used to, um, maybe not something good to get used to. Right. But, um, I never took offense to that after a while. So, um, there was never an ill feeling. It was more, you know, the, you know, the teachers were always understanding and then the students were kind of um, didn't really understand it. But, you know, it, for me, it was more of trying to understand the fact that, um, you know, I was I was learning English. Right. And that was kind of honestly, honestly, probably my first language. The reason I say that is because as soon as I got into you know school, my mom was like, what are you saying? Like, she, and I'm getting mad at her because she's not understanding my English, you know? Um, so me growing up, I think it was, for me, the biggest thing um, was not necessarily like the ill feeling towards me, but more of the complication that I made in my head about putting English and Spanish together. Uh, I gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. But you're fine now. <laughs> Definitely fine now. We understand you loud and clear. And so as time went on, you transitioned from secondary to higher education as a first generation student. How was that for you? Um, it was definitely complicated and, and confusing, right? There was not, there was nobody that could really give me that much guidance, right? I did my research, but I don't believe I uh, I did enough in the sense of being aware of, you know, some circumstances and some some things that will happen in certain cert scenarios, right? Um, so it was hard in terms of financially, okay, yeah, yes, I'm going to get a soccer scholarship. Yes, you know, I might get some academic, but what does that look like if I don't live on campus? Right. Oh, wow, right? Yeah. Saving an extra four or 5,000 mm. per semester. Like that's that's huge. Mm -hmm. So, and just understanding that, you know, um, yes, I love soccer. Yes, I want to play college soccer, but there's a bigger thing, bigger uh, vision for myself that was bigger than just soccer. I just didn't realize it yet. So it was definitely difficult because, yeah, you, you know, the guidance and just the misinformation um, that I didn't have, but I believe it was a lot up on me. Right. I'll take full responsibility for that. I didn't seek for the resources because the resources are there. I just didn't seek for them. I just looked for them. Yeah. Gotcha. Definitely. And again, I can relate to that. Definitely relate to that because first gen as well, you know, it was hard. 
It was definitely hard through that process. No one told me nothing. And I had to figure it out on my own. And so you graduated and you started a business. Talk about this awesome business that you have going on right now. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I was finishing up college, I really didn't have any type of direction. I mean, yes, business degree, but I mean, what that's very general, right? Yeah. I mean, and so for me, I loved marketing. I love business. And so I was like, well, maybe I can have a marketing business, right? And so in my head, I was like, that makes sense a little bit, right? But I also love sports. Oh my gosh, what, what can I do, right? And so what I realized was I knew that I needed to, to network, to connect with other people. And so once I got connected to good people, right? And I told you about this. I started to have some sort of clarity, right? And it wasn't immediate. It wasn't like, you know, we spent 15 minutes together and I was like, oh, I know my vision. I know what I want. I love these people. It wasn't like that, right? It was very awkward at first because I wasn't sociable, right? But I realized that when I got around good people, and I'm sure you could probably relate to this, I was in my head, I was like, these are the types of people my parents have always wanted me to be around. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I never felt that before. And so getting around the right people started to help me, you know, utilize and understand this, you know, there's different ways of doing things, but also, and, you know, in the space that I'm in e-commerce, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it, mm -hmm. but how do I beat the learning curve? How do I, you know, get to the right position? It was right. What we're talking about right now, which was maybe a father figure or some guidance. Right. Okay. And so, once I got the right guidance, things started to move forward, not only in business, but in my own personal life. Gotcha. gotcha. Right. I, yeah. I love that. Oh, I, I love that because it's making us the person we are today. And I, I must say, Alan, that I'm very impressed with what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing um, as well. And so you've been through a lot, right? Fatherless and, you know, first generation. How do you define your identity? How do I define my identity? Um, I, I define it as, you know, just a first generation former athlete that not only loves um, to learn, right, which I didn't realize in college, but also someone that that enjoys to give back to other people. Um, and I didn't know that that I like that until I started doing that more, you know, and 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 I feel like my vision is not just about me, but about other people. And that's why it's going to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. oh, you oh, know? Yes. oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow. So what encouraging words? I love to end with encouraging words. What encouraging words would you say to a young male that may be going through the same things as you did when you were growing up? What would you tell them? Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of things... Um, you know, when it comes to encouraging words, when it comes to tips, a lot of people will not take in what they need to take in because mm -hmm. they're not receptive to it because nothing really bad has happened or nothing really good has happened. I think it has to be an extreme. But um, I think my advice to a person that was maybe in my situation is to understand that there's always going to be resources. There's always going to be resources. But whether you look for them or whether you seek them is up to you. Mm. Now, you know, they're always going to be there, right? And and my opinion is there's no self-made millionaire, self-made billionaire because there's other people on this planet. Yeah. And so not being afraid to ask for help or even shadow someone can really move your not only life to you know together and and move forward, but also uh, maybe a potential business or your studies. I love that. I love that. Words to live by by Alan. Words to live by. How can they find you on social media? Yeah. So uh, on social media, just about every channel from Instagram, Facebook, um, and even Clubhouse, right? That's the new thing, um, is Alan underscore Caballero, right? And then on LinkedIn is Alan Caballero Ramirez. All righty. You heard it here. Thank you so much, Alan, for telling your story. I know that someone that may be going through what you have went through or something similar to is inspired and encouraged by your words and your life and your experiences. Thank you so much for being on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> 
on the next Michael Finkley. CEO of Black Tree TV, Jamal Finkley stops by. And comedian Reed Clark is with us. Next Finkley. Wednesday. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. And I hope that you were inspired, encouraged, and motivated by our two guests today. Thank you so much, Coach Eddie and Alan, for being on today. We really appreciate you, your words, your experiences, and your knowledge. Thank you so very much for being on. On the next Michael Finkley, we're starting off Black History and celebrating gospel music. And we have gospel artists on the rise. We have Marcus G. Martin. And, uh, and we also have uh, Linasia Tyson with us. And I'm telling you, they're going to bring it. They're gonna, we're going to talk about it. Your soul's going to get happy. Another show you don't want to miss. That's on Monday. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Michael Finkley Show, and ring the bell for notification. We'll see you in an email saying, hey, new content uploaded. Again, please listen out for us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And visit our website at michaelfinkleyshow.com. If you'd love to be a guest on The Michael Finkley Show, please email us at michael at the finkley experience.com thank you again for watching and guess what we'll see you monday have a good weekend